My name is Paul Barton, and I'm the chief designer and founder of PSB Speakers. Well, music has always been a fundamental part of my life and started at a very early age. My father was an avid musician. He was a very well-accomplished tenor in our area. When I was young, I would go to these rehearsals and really got an understanding of that whole world of music. Well, he was a, a perfectionist, no question about it. My father enrolled me in the string program. He realized that as I was getting a little bit bigger, at some point I'm gonna to have to get a full-size violin. He did purchase a violin in a case. It turned out the violin was not what he expected. It wasn't well made. He decided, well, I think I'm gonna build a violin. He'd never done anything like it before. Well, what I really started to appreciate was the art of woodworking how you can just take a block of wood and turn this into this beautiful sculpture. When he finished the violin, there are adjustments you can make. So I would play all the strings and try and get the sound to be balanced. I started to become kind of acquainted with listening for differences in sounds and that sort of thing. I was entered into a competition. I played against 20, 21 year olds and I was 11 years old. I not only won the contest, but I got the highest mark ever awarded. Well, it did teach me to be detailed and do, do the best I can. You know, that, that was obviously what I saw my dad do. In parallel with all of that, I had a, a knack for taking things apart and putting things back together. So that was really the beginnings of all my interest in modifying and uh, adding my own twist to these things. And, you know, as I went through high school, I got a job at a hi-fi store. And I decided to start building kits, loudspeakers that I could sell in the store. The university students, when they got their student loan, they would spend all their money on hi-fi. Students could build their speakers in their dorm with my kits. For people who came of age in the 1950s, what most of them wanted when they had a little money of their own in their pockets was their first car. Starting in the mid-60s, I think that shifted to a good stereo. You know, eventually I started needing help to get these kids ready. Two high school buddies of mine, Klaus Borchardt and Walter Herman, they became kind of interested in what I was doing. So Klaus, Walter and I started PSB the summer of 72. We rented a space out in a little town just north of Kitchener-Waterloo called St. Jacob's. So it was a really quaint place to start a company. We were in an old shoe factory. Because of my interest in loudspeakers, I decided to apply to the University of Waterloo. So I'd leave university at around five o'clock and I'd drive out to the factory. Time for me was just working and sleeping. Of course, back in those days, I would just pile the speakers in my car drive to a town. I would just walk in with speakers cold, say, I'm Paul Barton, I make speakers. Do you want to have a listen? One day, this guy walked into my shop. I didn't know who he was, and I'd never heard of PSB, and I'd never heard of Paul Barton. But he came in and sort of said, you know, I make loudspeakers. You know, we set them up, we listened to them, and I went, whoa, I don't have anything this good in my shop. Well, in 1973, I designed two models the Avante and the Beta 2. Well, the Avante was a two-way eight inch with a one inch dome tweeter. What was unique about it is I started using a technique by putting felt around the tweeter. And by putting felt around the tweeter, it tended to reduce the amount of energy moving across the baffle. Well, the Beta 2 is one of the most significant products, even though it was in the early stages of PSB. This speaker was a servo feedback speaker. It's the first speaker we produced where we had electronics inside the loudspeaker. This type of design is still actively used today. It spurred from my experiences and love for woodworking and watching my dad build the violin. This beveled edge miter on the corner became sort of PSB's industrial design. The fact that I was using feedback, this was kind of a new approach to designing loudspeakers. Dr. Floyd Toole was interested in the technology that we had used here. It was really the catalyst that got me introduced at the National Research Council. 
Paul, I call him the grandfather of the Canadian loudspeaker industry because in 1973, he got introduced to Floyd Toole at NRC. Arrangements were made. I drove to Ottawa. I never looked back since. The National Research Council was started in 1916, and the purpose of NRC was to help Canadian industry and technology compete around the world. They had a big anechoic chamber and tremendous testing facilities, and it allowed a small company without a lot of resources, like PSB at the time, to compete on the world stage. The anechoic chamber is very useful in dissecting how the speaker is performing so that you can interpret how it behaves. What the NRC did was systematized the relationship between measured behavior of a loudspeaker and how satisfied listeners were with the sound of that loudspeaker. So through a combination of loudspeaker measurements and blind listener tests where listeners weren't aware of what they were hearing, that research identified the key characteristics that a speaker has to have. Flat, even, amplitude response on axis, off axis response that mirrored on axis response, and freedom from distortion. So it was kind of a secret sauce. He was able to create these speakers at a price point which was quite significantly less than everybody else. And imagine me going into this community of scientists, PhDs, who allowed me to sit with them and listen to what they had to say. They were just so accommodating, so helpful. This is the Passive 2, which was the top of the line product. This speaker has quite a, a history in conjunction with all the NRC research that I had been doing. The CBC were in pursuit of recommendations on deciding what a universal monitor would be like. This product here was one of the few that were chosen to be used by the CBC. I remember when the PSB Passive 2 first came out with a big wall of sound, but also with refined detail. This was really the starting point of producing good value loudspeakers that had high performance. The Passive 2 just went like crazy. We sold so many of those speakers. Paul's ability to create a tremendous high-end sounding product for less than half of what was really out in the market. PSB's Project B2 is one of the most iconic hi-fi products I don't think many people know about. This was really a turning point for PSB, put us into another league, so to speak. What's become a hallmark of PSB is the idea of putting the mid-range or woofer over the tweeter. This is the first PSB to have this. I mean, it's a high frequency, so let's put it up high. I think that's the logic that people had when they were doing tweeter woofer designs. If I had the tweeter up on top and I looked below the speaker, it was much flatter than if I looked above the speaker. So I'm thinking, why don't I just put the tweeter below the woofer? Problem solved. Not only do the wings serve an acoustic point, they help with diffraction, they conceal the cabinet and they give the thing a more elegant look. And another reason this is an important speaker in PSB's history is because it was the last speaker before he partnered with Lenbrook. At the time, you know, British speakers were big and American speakers were big, and they had kind of a signature sound. The American speakers were, you know, a little bit more bass heavy, and the British speakers were a little bit more refined. It was a different sort of style of sound. Uh, my name's Gord Simmons, and I'm the president and CEO of the Lindbergh Group of Companies. Because the American brands and the British brands were driving things, our focus was there. Everything was about import right through the late 70s and into the early 80s. You know, PSB was Canadian. And it was interesting because it kind of fit in the middle. It wasn't the American sound, it wasn't the British sound, it was quite distinct, but it was very natural. Developing products that could be proven scientifically, it really helped the Canadian brands start to leapfrog this really subjective, almost black magic art of loudspeaker design. You know, the early 80s was a really interesting time. Uh, the Canadian dollar was really weak. So being an importer became really expensive. Made in Canada made great sense economically. Mark Stone contacted me 
on behalf of Gord Simmons' request to see if I was interested in having a discussion about the future of PSB. The rest is history. It was really a serendipitous situation where the brand needed a sponsor and we were well capitalized. Didn't take very long to say, yeah, this is a perfect match. And so I never looked back. Lembrook took PSB under their wing and I was able to continue doing the things I do best, which is conceive the product, design it and promote it. This is the 40R. This was the first series that came out after the acquisition. My wife and I would work together. We would sit at our kitchen table and I would sign every one of these by hand. So what he did was design the grill. It's actually chamfered here. When it's attached, it actually produces a smooth surface for the tweeter to output. I actually put a radius on here. It's not a sharp edge. This radius in conjunction with this slight bevel really creates a topology around the tweeter that minimizes diffraction as well. This is what really sets apart PSB, that deep understanding of the physics of sound reproduction. With the association with Lembrick, who are one of the best distributors in Canada, really PSB could almost parachute into already a well-organized and well-structured distribution network. People were talking about this Canadian sound and this Canadian speaker design. And so for us, it was time to start to look south of the border. It wasn't easy, it was tough work, uh, but we just kept at that. You know, we went from zero dealers in the United States to around 250. So this is the Atom. This is another 80s era PSB speaker. Now, PSB's always been about high value, reasonable price, and they've always had the engineering resources. Now there's the sheer scale of being associated with a large company that allowed a design to really go down in price and up in performance. I didn't compromise on the drivers or the performance of the system. I just compromised on a little bit of the aesthetics. We saw that it was time to start to look to Asia, start to look to Europe. You know, they really saw the story and they believed in all of the things that the National Research Council was bringing into this mature loudspeaker industry. The definitive moment for me was the introduction of the Stratus Gold. And I remember that audio magazine review with the picture of the Stratus in the cover. They called it the 10,000 watt speaker. It was just heft and authority. You can see that PSB went big. This is a large tower speaker, the kind of which PSB really never had before. An easy speaker to listen to, but also a, a very exciting, involving speaker to listen to. This speaker actually created a bit of a problem at Soundstage because we had a reviewer with a pair and nothing measured up to them. You would get people come into the shop and say, you know, What's new? What's Paul done that's new lately? Because he would come up with surprises. Like the PSB Alpha was a big surprise. So who expected that? The spirit of the PSB Atom migrated into what became very famous for PSB, the Alpha series. Now the Alpha series came out when people were really big into home theaters. The press really took to this speaker. We're talking about magazines that review products that are $5,000, $10,000. And I remember the Alpha made it to the cover of that magazine, which kind of blew us away because I think it was $199 a pair. Nothing could compete with that speaker. Well, we call this the Synchrony. It became our flagship after the Stratus Gold. You can see it in the look. They really stepped up the industrial design. Visually, it became a really refined product. This speaker was really amalgamating all of the things on the other models and just taking it into the next level of performance. The Imagine T3 takes the synchrony line and kind of ups the game. The innovation that came in here are the footers. It was when Paul started looking at the performance of the loudspeaker, not just in the room, but how it behaves on the floor. Would it make the floor into a sounding board? Would that distort the sound? 
So by coupling it to the floor, the floor becomes part of the mass of the loudspeaker and its inability to vibrate if excited. You'll notice on all our tweeters, there's a little device that's sitting on front of the dome. What this does is discourages any interference off axis that occurs if the dome is completely open. I remember when the Imagine T3 came out, High End Press did a whole rating of loudspeakers, and the T3 was in there, and it was literally a, you know, a tenth of the price of some of those really expensive high-end speakers. And that kind of creates this cult following. Paul, being around for so long, he's really been part of the family. When you focus in on what Paul's actually doing, he's not only enjoying the music, he's activating a different section of his brain. And I think that's one thing that I've really picked up from him is to be able to say, okay, what is actually going on right here? How much of this is coming from the song, the music, and how much of this effect is from the actual product itself? Part of PSP's future is the trend for people to want to take the high fidelity experience with them on the road. This is the PSP M4U. It was a really well thought out design in this way because Paul Barton travels a lot. Really is a benchmark product for PSB in that it was the first pursuit of sound reproduction using headphones. A big part of what Paul was striving to achieve on headphone design was to kind of get rid of this, this effect that you get with headphones, which is like you're stuck in your head. One of the things that makes these headphones sound good and quite natural is what PSB calls room feel. What does a speaker have to be designed like to behave properly in a room? And a lot of it was established with what was called the Athena Project. I didn't realize at the time that what we had learned about what a speaker should sound like in a room, which was the thrust of the Athena Project, actually can apply to headphones. So when you take a speaker and you put it in the room at low frequencies, the room starts contributing to the sound. It increases the bass. Let's just apply that curve or that target function to headphones. Boom, makes the headphone have the same balance and timbre that that musical event has when you put it on speakers in a room. This is the Synchrony T600. So it really represents the culmination of everything that's gone on here since 1972. Materials we use are always sort of based on what the state of the art is. And by using carbon fiber, in conjunction with the proper type of dust cap, produces a driver that just takes performance just up another notch. PSB, I think, is a brand that in all their products want to get the essential things right. It's led to great reviews. I think it's led to a lot of brand loyalty. The thing that really appealed to me about PSB was its musicality. Nothing artificial, nothing hyped up. A lot of companies would put what we call a smile curve on the speaker, so it would boost it in the bass and boost it in the highs. And it sounded kind of impressive at first, but when you listen to it for a while, you realize it really wasn't natural. It would be like looking through a glass to a beautiful, colorful spring landscape but you put a yellow tint on the glass, so you see the world through this filter. And we, as speaker designers, want our speakers to be clear glass through which you see the original acoustical event. And that was Paul's thing, and he was a musician. He was out to make a natural sounding speaker. It's not an accident. You know, one of the things that I always marvel at is just the strength of the relationship between Paul, PSB, and the world's critical hi-fi press. There's so much to talk about with PSB in terms of its history. The legacy of PSB, I think, is going to continue and do very well going forward because of the values that really are incorporated in the company and its very core. PSB obviously has a really important part in the center of our strategy. We're building a stable of premium audio brands, and PSB is uh, right in the core of that. It was our first and continues to be a brand that we're driving. The things that change are technologies. The things that change are, you know, market interests. But the fundamentals of, of who PSB 
is as a brand, those aren't gonna change. Value has always been a strong forte for PSB, and that, that comes from sort of my roots, I guess. I really enjoy people going, wow, is that all it costs? That means I've done my job. You know, where we're going from a point of view of marketing PSB today is really reaching out to this new consumer and authenticity and integrity seem to be really important. And no company that I know of can claim that any stronger than PSB. When someone hears a PSB product, they know they're listening to a PSB product, you know, from the flagship models right through to the lowest price models. Paul always said to me, I like to make speakers for real people. And real people are people who can afford them. Like a family. You know, people love the brand, they love the products, they talk about it to their friends, and, you know, it goes from generation to generation. It's something I've learned from Paul over the years. Really um, always keeping my ear open for the, the next thing. Basically, we're not resting on our, our laurels uh, when it comes to product design. We can carry that legacy of innovation into the future. PSB has set the stage for young up-and-comers to take that ball, which is a very robust ball, and go with it. Those characteristics and those values that Paul has as a, as a person, which are foundational to the whole brand, have been passed on now to a new generation. There's now a, a full team of people, not just Paul. I think PSB has a lot of potential to grow. Seeing PSB take its rightful place amongst you know, the top five to 10 brands in the history of Hi-Fi. I think PSB has every potential to have that position. To see Paul smile and say, yeah, you know, this is gonna get carried on. Well beyond my time as a loudspeaker designer, I think that that's what drives me every day. Yeah, well, I like to think of people who listen to PSBs, stop listening to speakers and just listen to the music. The end goal is the music. That's really where you've, you've made it. Experiencing the music as opposed to listening. The music is something that does something to me that nothing else does. I can't describe it in any other way. And I can only assume that happens to other people. And if I can do that to other people, I'm doing my job.